Okay, so let's talk about voice allocation in a synthesizer. And what I'm going to be talking about today is what I believe right now to be one of the essential parts in terms of what a analog synth, especially the traditional old school analog synths, um, why they sound quote unquote analog. What is this analog sound? And, you know, there's a million different things that we could be talking about that make up why something might sound analog, quote unquote. But what I'm going to talk about today is one of the biggest ones. And, I, and quite frankly, I think it's one of the more overlooked ones of um, when we talk about analog synths, uh, especially when it comes to poly, poly synths, so meaning more than one voice. So what I'm going to show you uh, in a second is I'm going to show you a few different, these are all software synths. None of these are real analog, but some of them are modeling analog in some kind of a way. And I'm going to show you different ways that different synth companies have dealt with this problem of how do we sound a little more quote unquote analog. So when we talk about this, what we're really talking about is um, slight variance between sounds. Specifically today, I'm going to be talking about tuning a lot. But these could be variants of a lot of different stuff. They could be variants of the filter. They could be variants of the envelope. They could be variants of volume. They could be variants of a lot of different stuff. But for right now, I, I'm going to be talking about pitch. Specifically, if we look at, um, well, really any analog synth, when you hit a note and then you hit it again, it's running through a, a uh, electrical process. And sometimes because of the way heat works, even in a mono synth, and because it it's, uh, was just firing this one capacitor and then you send a signal back through it again in a similar way, the same note, if you hit it one after another, there might be a slight bit of variance. And that's because these things are, they're, they're computers, or, or I'm sorry, they're electronics. They're, they're, there's, there's voltage, there's heat, there's, there's different elements that that need to charge and, and heat up and cool down and all that kind of stuff, which creates tiny, tiny bits of variance. So when we get into the digital world, what we often find, especially in the, in the old school traditional digital world, we often find that, that people were um, called digital synths cold or um, you know too unfeeling or too electronic. And then... In comparison, they were talking about analog synths as being warm or more natural sounding or whatever it might be. And what I think they're really talking about is this little bit of variance, this slight bit of variance. Sometimes it's more than slight, but often it's, it's very, very small. Sometimes it can be even hard to hear, but it's there. It's, it's no less there. So the old digital synths were every single time you played a note, it would fire back the exact sequence of code, and it was basically more or less mathematically the exact same every time you, heard, you played it. Um, with time, digital synth manufacturers realized that, oh, maybe we need to add a little bit of variance between it. Maybe this is a little too cold. Maybe it's a little, it is a little unfeeling. So they developed a few sort of simple, basic ways at creating a tiny, tiny bit of variance between the notes when you hit them. So I'm going to run you through a, a few different examples, which is going to illustrate a few different techniques um, for creating variants. And then I'm going to start talking about um, Jason Cooper's uh, uh, voice component modeling theory, which uh, I think he believes is catching on a lot in the synth world because we're starting to see uh, sequential cir circuits and some other people start to use techniques that he's been talking about, whether or not they've uh, admitted to, to reading his blogs or not, um, I think it's starting to gain some steam. And I know that recently I discovered this, and when I discovered it, kind of a light went off in my head, and it was like, oh, that makes sense. Okay? So let's, let's, let's talk about it real quickly. So I'm going to play the same note. They're all square waves. They've, they've been produced in a few different synthesizers. Some of them sound 
sort of similar. Some of them sound a little more drastically different depending on the synth hardware. Um, I'm sorry, if I said square wave, I meant sawtooth wave. Um, they're all going to be basic sawtooth waves. They're all going to have a tiny bit of decay. I did my best. I didn't spend too much time matching, but I think they're, they're pretty close, all things considered, in terms of decay and stuff like that. And they're not running through any filters uh, or any other effects or anything like that. So the first thing I'm going to be playing is I'm going to, I'm going to be playing an actual bounced in place uh, recording of one of these sounds. This one came from Serum, but it doesn't really matter where it came from. I'm also going to put this tuner up here so we can kind of you you can use your ears and you can also use your eyes as as we as we play along. Now, I do want to warn you that this is not going to be the most fun thing to listen to. Uh, it's not very musical. We're just going to hear the same note over and over and over again. But this is mathematically Precise, precise, the exact same note played one after another because it's a recording. It's the same recording played over itself. So let's watch it. And there's going to be a little value right here where my mouse is. You can keep an eye on that if you'd like. Okay. So that was exactly the same note. You could see it was pretty close to C, but every single time it was 0.11 cents up. And there wasn't really any variance. Now, there's a name for this that, that some people call the machine gun effect. And the reason why they call it that is in the old days of sampling, they would have a piano or a string sample or something like that. And they would play the same note over and over again. And if it was close enough, and if the ear, the human ear can, can kind of hear that it's the same without any variance. And it's going to be more obvious when I play, I'm going to play this at double speed right now. And you, you're going to be able to hopefully hear, really hear the machine gun effect. This is the exact same recording. It's just played at double speed. Now, do you hear how that sounds like a machine gun or it sounds very digital? It does not sound like a real instrument. It sounds like a computer. Okay. So, so what did people do? Well, some people and some synth manufacturers didn't do anything. So I'm going to play you this. This is a simple mono synth. It's in uh, Reaper. It's pretty much the most basic type of synth that you could have. And as far as I can tell, there's no variance between uh, 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 the, the note. Oh, sorry. It went on to the next one, which we're going to talk about in a second. But... Um, slight bit more variance than the than the digital recording and that might have to do with the way the envelope uh, is working maybe the envelope is still decaying when the next note is getting triggered and there's some some sort of interaction going on there but it's not that that dissimilar from from what we heard in the recording like that and then like that slightly different envelope um, value on this one okay so so how did synth, uh, uh, you know, clearly people are aware of this problem. Clearly people are aware that they don't want their music to sound too cold and too digital and too fake. So what did they do? Well, some synth manufacturers, and it's more common than you might realize, started to add a tiny, tiny bit of randomized variance in their, um, in their recordings. So I'm going to show you, I'm sorry, in their uh, uh, programming. So I'm going to show you this, this synth called Vital. And hopefully you'll be able to hear, I'm going to, I'm going to play it for you. And then at some point I'm going to A, B it between the simple mono synth and the vital. And if you really listen, you should be able to hear a little bit of pitch kind of wobbling up and down, up and down, um, on the vital that isn't existing on the simple mono synth, but let's just hear the vital first. Okay. So we're trying to listen for, does it go up and down and up and down a little bit? And I think it'll be more obvious maybe if we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth like this. Let's let's listen to that. You can kind of hear that this one just settles itself and becomes almost like a flat plane. And then this one, it's kind of moving a little bit, it's moving up and down. Now, I haven't been able to find, Vital I don't think, even think has a manual right now, but I haven't been able to find where the settings are uh, uh, that control all of this stuff. I know that um, 
when you change the oversampling, sometimes, especially in serum, this can change this behavior a little bit. Uh, I had it at draft and you could still hear it pretty well. If we listen to 2x or 4x, we might be able to hear it even more. Um, just to kind of accentuate what's happening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, purposefully go go further than when than what's actually happening behind the uh, behind closed doors. So what I'm doing right now is I'm putting a randomized thing. It's called a sample and hold, and I'm I'm attaching it to uh, uh, the fine tuning. And now you're going to really really hear it. This is more extreme than they would ever hard code into their uh, uh, structure, but just so you can really hear kind of what's happening behind closed doors. Okay, so that's an ex that's an exceptional version. This is the subtle version. But it's the same basic concept where somewhere in the back end of this is a random table of some kind. And every time they we hit the note, they're saying uh, change the pitch a tiny, by this tiny, tiny random amount. So what um, Jason Cooper talks about is he says, well, it's not actually random. And the way that these these old uh, uh, analog polysynths work is they would cycle between one, two, three, four, five, six, or however many voices they had, and they would just go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. So it wasn't just pulling from a completely random whatever. It was pulling from an actually n a non-random uh, a list of voices that it, that it had access to. And each one of those voices, just like how we talked about, because they're electronics, had a tiny, tiny bit of variance. Even if you did the most amazing tuning and servicing and all that kind of stuff, there would still be a tiny, tiny bit of variance. And what his argument is, is that even if this stuff was accidental, and I don't know how much it was accidental back then, uh, our ears are really used to that sound. We like that sound. We like the sound of of, in a chord, one note being a tiny bit this way and one note being a tiny bit this way, and for that to be reproducible, for it to not be randomly this way or that way, for it to be pretty much the same this way or that way every single time. This is, this is what he's talking about when he's talking about voice component modeling. It gets deeper than just pitch, uh, uh, but we're just talking about pitch for right now. Um, so... Um, there's a synth here, which, uh, full disclosure, I've been using for years. And one of the reasons I've been using it is it's, it just had this quote unquote analog sound that I was just in love with. And I didn't realize, now I've been reading their manual and all that kind of stuff, that they've been doing this stuff for a lot longer than a lot of other people. They're well aware that different voices have slightly different um sounds to them and the way they program the way they hard coded this 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 thing is that every single voice goes into a different channel which has tiny tiny different settings but they're not randomized settings they are specifically reproducibly off from each other this is the key okay so let's listen to this one i haven't um it's sounding it's gonna because of the way the filter works and stuff like that it's gonna sound a little bit different than the other ones that we've heard but um Hopefully you should be able to hear, still hear some of this randomness that we're talking about. Now you can actually see the different voices scrolling by, these little red uh, uh, dots. These are the different voices. Now if I accentuate it by changing the, the spread value and changing the oscillator to detune value, it's going to be just like how we did with the vital. It's going to be pushing our randomness a little further than what we did before. You can see there's a lot more than just 0.11 or whatever it was on some of the other ones. We're getting well out of the, the purely in tune C, especially when I do this oscillator 2 detune, because right now it's just oscillator 2 that's being played. You can hear it. Now, the important thing that's different between this and vital is, is that this is the same. Every single time it gets to this 
voice right here or this voice right here, it's detuned in the same value. Whereas in vital, in the, the other polysynth that we were looking at, it's a it's a, gonna be a random value. And this is this is getting to the heart of one of the things that that uh, I believe matters a lot when it comes to sounding a little more analog. Now, why does it matter? Could we just go and buy a modern analog synth and and because this is all electronics the same way the old ones were, we would just rely on the, the slight variance and that would give us the warmed up sound that we're looking for. Well, no. What, what uh, uh, Jason Cooper is actually talking about and what he's discovering is that some of these modern analog synths um, are actually more perfect than, than their counterparts that they're trying to emulate especially when we, when we come to this voice by voice by voice level. And each individual voice is a little more uniform in the modern era than they were back in the 80s or the 70s when we're talking about uh, uh, this era. And, and he's talking about how that changes the feel. And in a weird way, the counterintuitive part of all of this is that some of these modern analog synths without voice component uh, uh, variants uh, can sound less quote unquote analog than something like this, which is a digital, completely software instrument, which pays high attention to voice component variants. Um, so this is where we're getting at in some interesting territory. Now, some sense allow you to model and manipulate this in a in a reproducible way that can further get to uh, uh, this this voice component modeling that we're talking about. Uh, Jason Cooper goes into some depth in terms of getting the the Prophet Rev two, which is an analog synth, getting um, the uh, Deep Mind, which is a Behringer uh, uh, analog synth, and also uh, uh, at some point he talks about getting some software synths to to work like this. And um, it's, it's, it's a little counterintuitive, but what he's doing is he's taking these analog synths and he's hacking them in a way, or he's preparing the patches in a way to make them sound a little reproducibly, a little more vintage, uh, similar to their older counterparts than even their manufacturers uh, 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 originally intended. Now, I should mention that uh, Sequential Circuits has very recently um, introduced a knob that that uh, uh, used to be called detune, but then if you do some settings in it and you update your firmware, now it becomes a vintage knob. And um, the vintage knob turns your oscillators into working very, very similar to this. You can't modify them, or at least on my uh, uh, OB6, I can't modify them on my own um, the way uh, he's doing on some of these, uh, the Profit Rev 2 and the DeepMind. Um, at least I don't think I can. Um, but but somewhere in sequential, and uh, um, I wouldn't be surprised if it has to do with the, the work that Jason Cooper is doing, um, they've discovered, oh, wow, okay, he's on to something. This is, we're not just dealing with randomized values. We're dealing with specific lookup values that we're applying to our oscillators. Now, this goes deeper than just tuning because pretty much everything that I've been doing so far has been with one oscillator. But if you imagine three oscillators or two working together, and if you imagine um, slightly different uh, um, tuning values for the each oscillator, and each one of these being slightly different and not random, but being looked up and pulled from a, a, a database uh, in the exact same way, this is when you're really starting to get to modeling this classic polysynth behavior the way that we really like and the way that we respond to. And the other place that, that he talks a lot about is he talks about envelopes. He talks about the attack and the decay and the releases. And if these are moving tiny, tiny bits every single time, but in reproducible, they're, they're pulling from the same uh, database essentially, uh, um, then we're getting even further to 
getting to this analog uh, sound that we're looking at. The last place that, that's a little bit different, but, but that he talks a bit about is um, oscillator jitter. And that means a little bit of slight bit of pitch instability, even, even once you hit the note. And um, he talks a little bit about using some random, and using an LFO and using some randomized kind of sources um, to very, very ever so slightly uh, change the pitch in a barely perceptible, but in a way that when it all adds together, you can just kind of feel. So this is a long way of saying, what does quote unquote analog sound like? And do we necessarily need real analog hardware and is there a way potentially to, even in a fully digital uh, environment, to reproduce that analog uh, sound that we're all striving for, at least I'm frequently striving for? And in my opinion, the answer is yes. I, I am a firm believer that um, what Jason is talking about in this voice component modeling um, is the real deal. And I think it's much better than a randomized uh, data, randomized number like some of these other synths will frequently do. Um, and I suspect we're going to see a lot more of this moving forward as more uh, uh, people realize the importance and realize um, kind of the value to it. And just as before I log off, um, I'll just say that. Uh, the main value that I'm looking for right now to make sure that I could tr attempt to do this in any synth, whether it's software, digital, or analog, is um, is the voice number available as a mod source? That's the question. So like right here, if we go to the mod source in Vital, we don't have one that says voice number. And if we did, then I could have a lot of fun starting to model some of this stuff. But because we don't have voice number, unfortunately, with this vital synth, which is a great synth and I love it a lot, um, I can't use it uh, to, to model it in the way that uh, uh, Jason is talking about here. Um, I'll, I'll try to put some links uh, uh, to some of Jason's uh, videos and stuff like that in the, uh, in the comments. Uh, let me know if this is interesting to you. And... Um, I will uh, maybe make another video soon.